Welcome to Global Legal Confex. My name is Hussein Hadi, Head of Middle East Publishing and Legal Technology at LexisNexis, and I'm pleased to be talking to you today about digital transformation in a post-COVID-19 world, focusing on the UAE, but also drawing lessons uh, from other global jurisdictions. It's fair to say that we all, we're all aware that digitization is at the heart of everything we do. And this is a trend that's going to be accelerated in the wake of COVID-19. Certainly the legal sector is, tends to be one of the slower adopters of the potential of technology, but that's something that's uh, accelerating rapidly. Conservative estimates say that 22% of a lawyer's job and 35% of a law clerk's job can be automated. According to Deloitte, 39% of jobs in the legal sector stand to be automated in the longer term. So in this case, we're not talking about lawyers being replaced by robots, but we're saying that a lot of the repetitive, low-level work uh, that lawyers do can ultimately be performed uh, by algorithms, by machine learning. So we're talking about proofreading, simple contract drafting, those kind of repetitive tasks that can be done more efficiently uh, using legal technology. So uh, even before COVID-19, we were all aware of a sense that we need to embrace digital transformation. And I think this cartoon amusingly illustrates that. What do we mean by digital transformation? We have a sense that it involves collaborating with colleagues using tools such as Slack perhaps, or Yammer. Uh, we have to be moving things to the cloud, but what do we really mean by digital transformation in a practical sense? Well, uh, we've got a definition here. Digital transformation is how to use technology to remake a process so that it becomes more efficient or effective. It's not just about changing an existing service into a digital version, but improving it. Some of the technologies used in digital transformation projects are Internet of Things, blockchain, big data, and cloud computing, artificial intelligence, uh, and machine learning. In most cases, when we talk about the application of artificial intelligence in the legal sector, we're talking about machine learning sophisticated algorithms that can be used to analyze thousands, if not millions of case decisions, thousands, if not millions of contracts, finding particular patterns uh, and doing comparisons. Now, we've all had to adapt and change the way we work directly as a result of the pandemic. And this cartoon illustrates that whether we like it or not, COVID-19 has led the acceleration of digital transformation. I was with the Government Dubai Legal Affairs Department at the beginning of the year. We were debating uh, the issue of licensing virtual law firms that were operating in the United Arab Emirates. Um, the, the, the argument became a little bit mute, uh, uh, moots after a while, in the sense that we all had to become virtual law firms overnight. We all had to work remotely. We all had to uh, have access to all our processes without ever going to the office. Having an office in some ways is now redundant uh, to some extent. So this is something uh, to bear in mind. Uh, COVID-19 has accelerated many of the trends we were seeing already when it comes to digital transformation. So Richard Suskin is the, uh, the godfather of legal technology and the transformation of the legal sector. Um, his books have become uh, go-to uh, references when it, comes to, when it comes to how the legal sector is changing. Um, his first book was The End of Lawyers. Thankfully, that was The End of Lawyers, question mark, not exclamation mark. This was followed by Tomorrow's Lawyers and a new book on the future of online courts. He recently wrote an article talking about the five phases of recovery from, uh, from COVID-19 for law firms. And one of the things he noted was many of the technologies and techniques that have been forged in the heat of mobilization and lockdown will be regarded as preferable to tr traditional ways. Clients will have seen the great inefficiencies of conventional working practices and insist that the digital alternatives are maintained, as many have predicted, but in a far shorter period, great swaths of professional work will be automated and transformed by technology. So there's no going back. A lot of people will have seen uh, the inherent inefficiencies of the old ways and want to stay with the new forms, the new types of technology that we're now using. It's now become mainstream to use remote working tools. We're all very familiar with using Zoom, using Microsoft Teams. And when it comes to how law firms have responded uh, to COVID-19, you can see in the bottom of this slide uh, the five phases of recovery. Uh, 
Uh, we're now on phase three, the emergence. Uh, you know, people are starting to go back to the workplace, and that varies. Certainly in the UAE, many law firms have gone back to work, but some of them operate team A on one day, team B on another day. Some are only operating at 30% capacity, such as Denton's, or having alternatives such as El Um, But there is a risk that we might go back to phase two lockdown. Certainly, we know that different countries are experiencing different um, uptakes in case numbers. So, for example, in Oman, they recently imposed more restrictions than before um, as a precaution. And we know that other countries have perhaps opened up a little bit more as a result of uh, more confidence in how the cases are being dealt with. So, we're at the emergence phase, but it remains to be seen, are we ready to move on to the surge phase, where... We, we start to accelerate back to a level of economic activity that we might have seen before. It's fair to say that most of the global associations have institutionalized using uh, remote working tools and other types of technology. So, for example, the International Chamber of Commerce, very well known in the arbitration space, has issued a guidance note talking about using remote working tools effectively, whether it's Microsoft Teams, Video Cloud, Skype for Business, Zoom, Blue Jeans, GoToMeeting. This guidance notes provides advice on using these tools and things to bear in mind. Uh, they've also provided uh, guidance on other types of technology that are helpful, such as Opus, TransPerfect, and XBundle. So it's good to see here that uh, a global institution has taken the lead in advising on how people should be using tools. Uh, similarly, the International Bar Association has a fantastic library uh, of guidance on technology resources for arbitration practitioners. So they have guides on audio and video conferencing tools. Uh, they have guidance on document management tools. So they basically take practitioners through some of the types of legal technology available and how they can be using them. Uh, so it's good to have mainstream uh, validation. Let's take a step back and look at uh, some of the perceptions of digitalization that were happening even before COVID-19. Uh, so the first thing I should say is that the International Bar Association hosts an annual call conference called Building the Law Firm of the Future, a really interesting event that looks at uh, where do we see the legal profession changing over the coming years. So the uh, conference that took place last year in London considered some of the challenges coming forward. And there was a really interesting study that uh, took place from the Cambridge Strategy Group. And I've included some of the findings here from Robert Millard. Uh, so we can see here, what are the most mentioned challenges uh, when it comes to understanding and using legal technology? For most people, the challenge is understanding the opportunities offered by new uh, digitally induced legal needs. Most people are not sure where to start. People are concerned about the cost of acquiring new technology. Uh, assessing value, separating hype from reality. A lot of times the technology has overpromised and underdelivered. So for a lot of practitioners out there, it's a question of knowing where to start. How do they trust which technology to turn to? Um, this is an interesting slide because this actually tells you some of the types of technology that people are investing in right now, uh, or at least prior to COVID-19. As uh, so you can see here, there's a slight difference between the investment made by larger international law firms, shown in gray, and then these smaller uh, law firms in the, in the blue and the, and the turquoise. Uh, so you can see here, for example, when it comes to legal research, there's not, a, there's not too much of a difference between the investment made by larger firms and smaller firms. In contrast, if you look at knowledge management and training or legal document automation, you'll see more of a difference between the larger and the smaller firms. Uh, you can also see here uh, some of the other tools being invested in, and, and there's more of a marked change between the larger and the smaller firms. You can see here, uh, for example, legal compliance, uh, a much bigger spend with the larger law firms compared to the smaller law firms. Certainly with e-discovery, which tends to be a more expensive technology tool, you can also see that difference there as well. If we look at the perspective of in-house lawyers, the, the, the Association of Corporate Counsel is, an, and is a global association that represents 40,000 in-house lawyers worldwide. Um, they have an annual survey which looks at some of the key trends and some of the key things keeping in-house lawyers awake at night. So the 2020 ACC Chief Legal Officer survey showed that uh, CLOs are increasingly helping to drive the strategy of the business. They, are, they have a seat at the strategic, strategic table but there's still room for improvement uh, in that regard. 
Compliance, data privacy, security are the most important issues for business. Uh, leadership and business aptitudes are the most desired non-legal skills for in-house counsel. Uh, keeping up with new regulations, data protection, GDPR, these are inherently important and these will continue to uh, be important issues for in-house lawyers going forward. Uh, regulatory compliance spend is certainly up. Chief legal officers are looking to implement technology to achieve efficiency. The use of artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning, is expected to accelerate. And people talk about delivering value to customers as a priority over maximizing profit. So it's about finding uh, answers to business problems, finding solutions, putting yourself in the customer's perspective. And, that, and when we talk about customers, we might be talking about our internal customers or our external customers. An interesting question that was asked in the survey is, in the last 12 months, have any of you done the following to increase your law department's efficiency in its delivery of legal services? You can see here nearly 60% have looked at redesigning their workflow processes. Just under half are looking to uh, greater use of legal technology solutions. And then 41% are looking at project management efforts. Now, for me, these three uh, top reasons in some ways are interlinked. To some extent, you can't really talk about using legal technology or investing in greater technology if you don't understand your own workflow processes. Until you define what it is that you actually work on, what are the pain points in your organization, only then can you then bring technology. So I brought in a quote that perhaps illustrates that point very well. You must get your own house in order first. Don't just use it, get a piece of technology of technology, you need to understand your business first and foremost. What are the workflows that come through the legal department? What is your management information telling you about the risks in your business? When you understand the processes, then you can start to interrogate where technology can make a difference. So part of the journey is understanding how your business works. How do you actually share information? How do you store information? How do you collaborate across different business units? What's your workflows? What's your pain points? Once you understand that, then you can invest in technology. And the reason that you have to undertake that exercise, as was uh, mentioned earlier, is that there's a whole host of different legal technology providers out there. We have more than 1,000 legal tech providers worldwide. This map illustrates just some of the major brands out there. If you look on the bottom left-hand side, you can see some of the key legal research players like LexisNexis, of course. If you look at uh, some of the law firm practice management solutions out there, you've got Clio and Practice Panther. If you look at some of the contract management tools, Kira, Luminance are quite uh, popular brands as well. So when it comes to starting on the journey uh, of, of acquiring legal technology, it's understanding your own business and then trying to determine which of these brands, which of the tech currently available can make a difference. So let's turn to the United Arab Emirates. Where do we stand? Well, the first thing to say is that the UAE legal market is one of the most diverse and competitive legal markets in the world. Uh, we're, bl we're blessed with a whole array of different law firms that operate here. I, just in Dubai alone, we have more than 120 legal consultancy firms registered with the government of Dubai Legal Affairs Department. We have over 400 advocacy firms registered with the government of Dubai Legal Affairs Department. So just in Dubai alone, we have a hugely competitive market uh, with law firms from all over the world. Interestingly, uh, over 55% of legal consultants in Dubai come from common law jurisdictions, mostly the UK. So it's interesting to see the different uh, balance uh, of uh, perspectives that are brought into this legal market. So this being a very competitive, uh, competitive legal market, um, it's traditionally been driven by the big ticket work. So for a lot of the global international law firms. Uh, they've been advising on these big mega projects, whether we're talking about desalination pl plants, infrastructure projects, and of course, having an arbitration practice linked to construction disputes, engineering disputes, has been a, a historic uh, key marker of success as well. As the market has become increasingly uh, competitive and some of that uh, infrastructure work has become a bit more restricted than perhaps it was before, uh, there is increasing pressure on, uh, on fees, uh, a lot more uh, commoditization of legal services. Uh, that high value strategic work is perhaps uh, 
more important than ever before. More, law firms have to be competing on that high level strategic value space and not competing for that low level commoditized work. So I'm, I've been teaching legal technology with the government of Dubai Legal Affairs Department uh, for a couple of years now, and I can share some of the findings that I've seen uh, talking to different uh, practitioners, focusing primarily on the legal consultants rather than advocates. So the first thing to say is that most legal consultants have a limited understanding of the range of legal technology solutions available. Although most of them will have used at least one legal tech solution in their firm. So that could be a business development uh, tool, it could be a uh, contract automation tool, it could be a legal research tool. But it's fair to say that most law firms already use a legal research tool such as LexisNexis within their firm, uh, looking up laws, regulations, case law, etc. Um, less than 20% of legal consultancy firms have begun using contract automation tools. And in most cases, they're looking at uh, SBAs, non-disclosure agreements, employment contracts, simple uh, contracts that perhaps don't have too many elements. It's also clear that less than 10% of legal consultancy firms have begun using a web portal to interact with their clients. So that's something that more and more people are looking into, but it's an example of a relatively quick win. Um, the Law Society of Singapore recently asked in-house lawyers, what te technology tools do you, would you like to see law firms in Singapore invest in for the benefit of their clients? And the top two that came out were client portals and document automation tools. Uh, so those were things that in-house lawyers in Singapore wanted to see more of from practitioners uh, in the Singapore market. Turning to the UAE, we can see that um, only 10% of legal consultancy firms are investing in client portals. I expect that to accelerate going forward. Uh, less than 20% of legal consultancy firms have begun using contract automation tools. I expect to see that accelerate going forward as well. Almost all law firms feel that they could be using their existing technology uh, tools more effectively. Now, this is an important point. You don't have to go about uh, buying expensive technology just for the sake of it. It's about adopting the mindset that you want to be more efficient. Clients expect uh, quicker, uh, cheaper services. They expect more for less. Uh, they expect people to be using tools to provide uh, solutions to their business problems most effective and efficient way possible. So one of, the, one of the easy ways for law firms to embrace this is to look at using their existing tools more effectively. So for example, do people use the rules on Microsoft Outlook, which is almost like having a virtual assistant uh, to manage your emails. If I have an email coming from a very important client, that automatically goes to a particular folder. If I have emails coming related to a particular project, that gets forwarded to everyone who has been assigned to that project. Similarly, we're used to using Microsoft Teams for video conferencing. Are we using all the hidden features of Microsoft Teams, uh, such as tagging, such as making sure that any emails sent are incorporated within uh, the Microsoft Team channels, uh, using the pin function, so the most important chats that we're taking, that are taking place appear at the top of the screen. Are we using web monitoring tools to help us update ourselves when it comes to changes in laws? Are we making sure that we're aware that any change in any regulatory website gets, uh, in, we get informed about that automatically without having to do that ourselves? You might be using a tool like LexisNexis. You might be using a tool like Westlaw when it comes to legal research. Perhaps if you're unable to obtain those tools, you might, you could use a free software which will actively monitor regulatory pages for you and let you know if there's any changes uh, to any of the regulations there. So these are examples of quick wins using existing tools more effectively. You might want to consider using uh, uh, voice recognition software, using free apps like iScanner. If you don't have a scanner at home, you can take a picture and convert it to a PDF. There's a whole range of tools we have at our fingertips right now that we can use to be more efficient in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, the next point is most law firms feel there is a lack of legal technology that is suitable for the Middle East market that incorporates the Arabic language. Now, this is true to some extent. Most of the global legal technology players uh, do not work that well with the Arabic language. But there has been a response to that. I'm pleased to say that we have a United Arab Emirates-based uh, legal tech startup called uh, Code Engines. Code Eng Engines is a case management tool but it also covers uh, different areas of practice management and it can help 
automate your workflow and uh, provide visibility of uh, all the different cases uh, that a law firm or an in-house team might be involved with. It has a dashboard. You can look at the progress of the case. Uh, you can have access to all the different documents and files related to any particular case. So case Engines is an example of a local startup that has responded and works with the Arabic language. Similarly, App for Legal is a Lebanese-based practice management tool, which is very flexible and covers different areas of practice management, whether it's billing, whether it's uh, document automation, etc. So the tools have been started uh, to, to emerge, whether it's uh, you know, regional players like App for Legal, uh, Case Engines. Uh, we're seeing more legal tech players arrive in the Middle East, and I expect that to continue. A lot of the global law firms do leverage some of their e-discovery and contract analysis tools from their London or European offices, so that's sometimes deployed in the Middle East. But it's fair to say that when it comes to smaller firms, there is a little skepticism and uh, concern about the affordability of legal tech solutions for their day-to-day -day needs. But as I said before, many of the tech players do have offices in the Middle East. Um, you can see examples of interesting initiatives like Legal Advice Middle East, which is an online platform which match makes consumers and law firms together. So you can pay, for example, $100 for 15 minutes with an employment lawyer, which is nice to see. Law firms are looking to use technology to engage and collaborate with clients. Um, so, for example, Latham & Watkins has a UAE free zone navigator tool where you can compare and contrast uh, the different requirements between different free zones. Uh, Rouse & Co., which is an IP law firm uh, in the UAE, has an IP toolkit where you can answer a questionnaire and get a health check on the status of your uh, IP uh, assets, whether it's trademarks, copyrights, or your patents, etc. Um, a lot of law firms are starting to license their technology tools uh, to their clients. So it could be a contract automation tool, could be a contract proofreading tool, etc. And corporate counsel teams themselves are beginning, are beginning to outsource specific tasks to alternative legal service providers to control costs, and they're looking at ways they can be more efficient in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so at the end of the day, things are changing. We do have the technology players in the Middle East, but first and foremost, the number one message is do not be intimidated by all the different legal technology solutions out there. Start first and foremost by identifying your own pain points looking at your own workflows, and once you've ta undertaken that exercise, once you've understood where technology can make a difference, then you can look at embracing some of the legal technology players out there and using it to be more efficient in your day-to-day -day work. Uh, good luck on your journey, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.